part of the problem that I've got in this case is that my, my client is being blamed for hires and we have nothing to do with it. And I need a toxicologist to say, hey, there's no way we're even related to this stuff. All right. Part 16 is now in session on Timothy Lewis presiding. Please be seated. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Let's go ahead and set forth our appearances. I will camp and let's go and make appointments. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Joel will be on behalf of the Rural Water Entities. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Scott Rasmus on behalf of the Head NCC. Hello, Judge Jim Neal and David Spurlock on behalf of UNFW. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Jim Cavanaugh, Gordon Reese, Las Vegas, Real Water, Tennessee, LLC. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Ron Robbins from Milwaukee. So we switched up a little bit. We did. Yeah. All right. And I guess before we get started, I just want to introduce you to my new law clerk, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. And, uh, she started yesterday, and um, she'll be working for a year. Uh, she's a boyfriend. Um, she did her undergraduate uh, at uh, Boise State. And she's a Frau Bronco. Football, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, she's been doing a wonderful job since she's been here, and she'll be well. Anyway, before we get started, is there anything we need to address outside? Yeah. Okay. A couple of things. And um, <clears throat> I, I don't know why we've been busy, so busy. In fact, we just finished up closing an argument in a case yesterday. It was a breach of contract, breach of applied covenant, good faith, and fair dealings. And, a lot of construction issues in any way. We've been busy. But I decided uh, <clears throat> what we need to do is, uh, I know we have some pending matters, and I need to get a couple of those done every day. And so uh, I just decided, you know, we I got drafts of it, but I'm just going to go ahead and go from the bench just to kind of speed things up a little bit. And, uh, <clears throat> and this is one of the important uh, motions that was filed. And it was a uh, plaintiff's motion to strike UNF's answer. And I guess that would be docket number uh, 259, uh, 529. Is that correct? Now? Yes. Okay. And you know, I thought about this and I uh, don't mind telling, sharing this with you. And I do understand, uh, just as important too, uh, we have the Young versus Johnny Ribeiro case, which is a very important case as pertains to potential sanctions, uh, whether it's discovery, whether it could be uh, maybe a spoliation situation. And so I sit back and I thought about the motion. And I just have a couple comments about the motion strike the answer. And it's my recollection that, that the uh, <clears throat> one of the issues involved in this case dealt specifically with uh, Haley and Belsky as plaintiffs in this matter. And then, um, I thought about the gross sales receipts that were produced as a result of the 16.1 uh, production in this case. And in a general sense, they really didn't address <clears throat> the key issues, and that would be the purchase history of some of the plaintiffs in this case. And so uh, um, it was what it was, but I didn't really consider that as being a key factor in my decision making. Uh, just as important too, and I think this is really important, I'm focusing on the metadata and the spreadsheets or the Excel spreadsheets that were produced in this case. And, um, and I have uh, grave concerns in this respect as to the reliability of those documents because they would be more akin, in my opinion, to attorney work product <laughs> than anything. And um, there shouldn't be a screening process as it pertains to uh, data or purchase data um, regarding uh, employees of Whole Food. Uh, and we had we had rigorous discussion about this issue, and if that was going to be done, there should have been an ESI protocol in place or or something like that, right? And and here's another issue, and I think it dealt with the timing of the production because it was shortly before the deposition, the de some of the key depositions in this case. And, um, and I do understand we do have a, a 
kind of a companion case, I mean a companion issue regarding the production of the Sandstrom affidavit or declaration, right? And so what I want to do is, and I think, and I just want to express my thoughts as far as that's concerned on the record, because there was a, there was a motion, uh, uh, defendant's motion for discovery sanctions, and we had plaintiff's counter motion for an adverse inference, and this all kind of ties together. This is, this is kind of how I see the Sandstrom declaration and or statement. And I look at that in this regard, um, because as a practitioner, I probably had, I would say a couple of thousand statements taken from, from witnesses and, and more, more specifically recipient witnesses. And so uh, when it comes to my understanding, there might have been some sort of delay as far as that production is concerned. But nonetheless, I, and I see that in a different light in this one important respect. It was her statement, right? Either she agrees with it or doesn't agree with it. I know there's a motion to exclude that, but, uh, and we'll address that. But, um, and just as important too, she wasn't a manage, managing speaking agent as far as uh, Whole Foods is concerned. She just wasn't. I realized she had a, She was like a cashier or manage, manager, something like that. That's my recollection. But, uh, and this is important too, when I looked at the uh, impact of the, the spreadsheet and uh, the data that was produced, I was sitting here thinking about how can I turn back the hands of time as far as that's concerned, and that's very difficult to do because that information is in the, in the record now. And um, if you're going to produce uh, uh, data as it pertains to employees, uh, the data should have been specific. There should have been an agreed upon protocol. The raw data or sales data should have been produced. Uh, prior to the deposition, both sides should have had an opportunity to review it and then talk, you know, during the deposition, as far as the uh, employee witnesses are concerned and or Ms. Sandstrom, uh, they, there should have been no issue regarding where the data came from. And I do think that impacted ultimately uh, their competence and their deposition testimony, uh, second guessing, and those types of things. And I don't know what she can do as far as this case is concerned, because I can't turn back the hands of time on that. Uh, I do feel this, and for the record, I thought uh, about the factors that are set forth in Young versus Jenny Rivero, and I also read some of that into the record. Uh, and in that case, it's a 1990 case, and this is straight out of the case at page 93. It says, quote, uh, the factors a court may properly consider include, but are not limited to the degree of willfulness of the offending party. And, and, and when I looked at that, I have to take that into consideration because of the simple fact that how the um, Excel spreadsheets were obtained, right? And they wanted, this wasn't a scenario where it was just a simple production of fact-specific sales history as to, uh, Hopeful employees vis-a-vis -vis, uh, real water. Uh, and I realize there's a process in place, but you know, you don't get a chance to pick and choose how you conduct that process. It should be done under the rules of discovery. And I think that that was problematic. And this is a, another, this is an important factor I considered. It says the, the extent to which the non-offending party may be prejudiced by a lesser sanction. And so I really took that into consideration, uh, weighing and balancing whether under the facts of this case I should strike the answer. And I'll talk about that a little later. <clears throat> the next factor, the severity of the sanctions of dismissal relative to the severity of the discovery abuse. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at this in this respect. I'm, I'm focusing on, all right, um, there are problems here. And uh, what would be the fairest way to uh, cure those problems. That's probably the best way to say that. Uh, whether any of the evidence has been irreparably lost. That's a big, that's a big factor there too. Uh, that's something potentially I can, I can make a decision on that <coughs> impact, impact um, uh, the course of this case. 
the next factor would be the feasibility and fairness of alternative less severe sanctions. And once again, I'm thinking about that. Um, and it goes on, it says, such an order naming the facts relating to improperly withheld or destroyed evidence uh, to be admitted by the uh, offending party. And, and as far as the specific purchase history data, and I think it relates to, um, I just want to make sure I get the proper plaintiffs, that was Haley and Belsky. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Sure. Okay, I just want to make sure. And that's what we're talking about here. Um, uh, another factor of policy favoring adjudication and merits, and uh, whether the sanction unfairly operates to penalize a party for misconduct of his or her attorney and the need to deter both parties and future litigants from similar abuses. And so this is what I'm going to do as far as the motion is concerned. And this impacts a couple of other motions. Uh, regarding the motion strike uh, UNF's answer in this case, uh, I'm going to deny that. But that doesn't mean that, that there won't be sanctions. And uh, I realize in the other, other we have defendant's motion for discovery sanctions, and we have counter motion for adverse inter inference. And I think this kind of, my decision will cover a lot of that. Uh, this is what, what, what I'm going to do. As far as the motion's concerned, I'm going to grant in part, deny in part. I'm not going to strike the answer. But I, from a, a fairness perspective, and I looked at um, some of the facts in this case, and I think it was in the reply to the motion I don't know if I have it right here, but there were some recommendations made by the plaintiff as it pertains to uh, Haley and Belsky ingesting enough um, hydrazine to cause liver injury. I think that was one of the requests. Is that correct, Mr. Kemp? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Okay. I'm going to grant that request. Uh, the second issue deals with uh, the striking of the toxicologist expert. And it's my understanding that a lot of that was related. And uh, I'm going to grant that request. Last but not least, the Excel spreadsheet shall not be used in this case. And this is important, too. We go, and I think that covers all the three areas. I'm not going to strike the answer, but uh, I'm gonna, that's where I'm going to go. Uh, just as important, too, uh, regarding the motion for discovery sanctions, we talked about that. I think that that's, the, that's docket number 20, 268. Uh, the counter motion for adverse inference under, under my ruling, it seems to me that might be moot. Is it? Uh, I think so, Your Honor. Right? I, I think that's moot. And so, for now, we've covered plaintiff's motion to strike, UNF's F's answer, docket number 259. And uh, we've also just covered a defendant's motion for discovery sanctions and plaintiff's counter motion for an adverse inference. Those have been covered, right? <coughs> I just want to make sure I'm not leaving anything, guys. Uh, Your Honor, Joel, you're about real water. Yes. Um, plaintiff Dulce is still making a claim as far as real water. Um, goes and so uh, inquiring as to if this sanction would affect, how this sanction will affect real water and real water's defenses. Well, I think uh, Your Honor, I need to join in that as well, but just so I make a record because he had it is being blamed for both of these as well. Although we have nothing to do with hydrazine, right? Well, so I, how does this how do I if you say they ingested enough hydrazine to make them ill, <coughs> I'm now lumped into and have done nothing wrong with that particular inference. So we may have to think this one through as to where I... Well, I, may, I, well, I, I think where, where, where you're impacted, I mean, I still think you have your um, products liability defenses as to labeling and fitness for a particular purpose. Is that all? No, no, no. I mean, you still have your defenses. I agree. With you. There's no claim for that. You've already ruled on that. Thank you. You get to say the words. That's it. There is no cause of action for fitness for a particular purpose. That is the ruling of this court. Oh, absolutely it was. We have to go back to the transcript by will, but you absolutely said that. There's no cause of action for it. That's not what the ruling was, Your Honor. The ruling was that 
there was an implied warranty of fitness for this for, for this particular purpose, and that's what it was limited to. The, you know, the issue of causation was left open. That's what the ruling was, and the announcement of the bench. I, I, I think I have my notes here. He granted it limited to that extent. The motion was granted. It was granted to a, you may say, that was it. That would be a uh, motion for summary judgment since Do you have the document? I'm sidetracked, though, Your Honor. We need to, I don't, we can deal with this later. No, that's okay. But I mean, the impact, it, this goes with ingestion, but it, it was my recollection. I mean, I haven't granted summary judgment as, as it pertains to your client, have I? No, you mean my, my motions for summary judgment haven't been heard yet? No, because they have not been heard yet. Okay, but I mean, I, I haven't granted summary judgment against your client. Your client was responsible. Well, Mr. Kemp believes now that I've been yeah, summarily the, the, the judgment the against him. For summary judgment, that one of the purposes of the implied warranty of fitness was making out on water. That was granted. It was a limited motion for summary judgment, but it was granted. But that's different than a motion for summary judgment on the issue of liability. Correct. I mean, it's, yeah. it's one element of the implied warranty of fitness claim. Right. So if I have a, if there's an adverse inference now that these people got sick from that, and I'm part of this down there for a fitness for a particular purpose, I'm now melded into this. As, as I read it, Your Honor, and I think that's unfair to my client, unless we want to think about some other ways to make sure that that doesn't, because we're not, we, we, I have a toxicologist who's going to testify there was no way that they had enough hydrogen in them to be able to say that they ever got sick. All I can say is this, and this was the primary issue, and the spreadsheets and the metadata and the way this whole issue regarding uh, the sales history should not have been handled the way it was handled. Uh, look, I, I can't disagree with you. you. You found that finding, okay? I don't necessarily agree with the finding, but you've made that finding. Right. The reality is that's not my party, though. But the the inference, right, that you will so, be... So tell me this, that you're... Your toxicologists rely upon metadata and spreadsheets and no. all those things? No, no Your Honor. Nor, nor, did, nor did theirs. Nor did ours. Nope. The, the only expert who's relied on this data is, is the plaintiff's medical expert. But, I mean, that's, is that true? Because yes. My, wait, wait, no, let me no, finish. Let me finish, and this is my point. Uh, Why was the Excel spreadsheets utilized in such a way to attack and or challenge the recollection of the Whole Food employees? It, it wasn't used at all, Your Honor, with one of the two. And with the other, it was used to ask whether her recollection was consistent with that purchase history. But, but see, that, that purchase history wasn't proper. It, it wasn't. I'm going to rule as a matter of law. That was improper to do it that way. Your Honor, I, I, I'm at an absolute loss. I don't want to Why? Well, I can tell you why. If you're going to, number one, that was attorney work product. I mean, no. that was pro, I mean, you're going to tell me that it's okay to go and take the data from Whole Foods, go to the lawyer's office, prepare a spreadsheet. They no, There's been no issue regarding the ESI protocol and what specifically should have been produced. And that's okay. And then you take it to Miss Sandstrom, and then you challenge her recollection, or or, or make her uh, vacillate on specifically what happened Your regarding Honor. the sales history of Mr. Belsky and or Mr. Haley. Your Honor, I'm sorry, but the court has a, a very fundamental misunderstanding of what's happened. We we produced exactly what was asked. It wasn't attorney work product. But, I, but I, you know, but but you produced it. You didn't produce it in the right form. You're telling me that it's okay for a lawyer to go grab data from Whole Foods and then cipher through it and then put it in a spreadsheet no, sir. and produce it? No, sir. The attorney didn't go to Whole Foods. Whole Foods produced it. The attorney didn't cipher through anything. Whole Foods produced it. It is unmolested data. How do we know it's unmolested data? From how, we, how what, what, what was the ESI protocol? It, there was not one, Your Honor. Okay. You'll recall the discovery instructions from the plaintiff that said if you're pulling data from a database, put it in a spreadsheet. Well, That's what we did. 
Judge, it's unmolested Mr. data Mr. according Neal. to the sworn testimony. Mr. Neal wants to file a motion for reconsideration. Yeah. Yeah. That's but, that's you know, fine. how about I just tell you, that, I mean, we don't need to go there. I felt that was highly problematic. I don't mind saying that. You have said that, Your Honor, and I'm sorry I haven't done a better job of showing the court what happened. But the fact of the matter is this. The plaintiffs asked for each and every element of this data. It was asked for in this form. We provided it in when this you ask, When you say, so they said produce it in an Excel spreadsheet? Yes. You'll recall yeah, the discovery yeah. instructions that well, we could go this, over. This I, is Mr. Parker's motion, so if Mr. Neal wants to file a motion for you, I'm sure you'll give him an order short of time that he can do that. And I'm, 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 very, I'm going to be candid with you. It should have been produced in a raw data form uh, format, and whether it was in the cloud or came straight from the stores, it should have been produced in that way. Sir, uh, the only way to pull data from a database is from a spreadsheet. But, but this isn't, this is, no, it, 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 wait, wait a second. I, and I've been around the block a little bit. Of course it's going to be in a printout, right? But this was an Excel spreadsheet that was prepared with the assistance of counsel. It, Your Honor, I'm sorry, you're fundamentally mistaken, respectfully. It was not done with the assistance of counsel. That's what Mr. Shank's affidavit says. Well, uh, counsel asked Whole Foods for it. Whole Foods gave it to counsel. Counsel modified their names on the document. I don't know how he can say it's not a fair document. Your Honor, um, I, I don't mean to move to reconsider. I won't do that. I will note myself. That's your, that's your right. I mean, uh, well, we, we'll have never, to. Wait, 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 wait. That's your right. I never told, I've never instructed the lawyer to have to reconsider anything. I mean, if you feel that there's a wrong or fundamental misunderstanding. But I looked at this and thought about this in a significant way because I was concerned about the reliability of the data. I, I don't know how that the court can have that concern when Mr. Shank has executed a sworn affidavit. Who's that Mr. Shank? The, the person Shanks. who pulled the data. I understand. He's the business he's intelligence he's, 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 he's the custodian of yeah. records. Yeah, yeah, he's the, yeah, he pulled the data. And did he pull it pursuant to an ESI protocol? Would that explain? What, I mean, I, I, I really think it's, it's probably, and then, then also, just as important, the timing of when the data was produced. Your Honor, it was produced upon each re subsequent request from the plaintiff. There was a letter request and a discovery request. We have responded. Wasn't this produced right before the deposition of Sanchez? Yes, Your Honor. No, Your Honor, it was absolutely not. It was produced 349 before Mr. Haney's deposition. The, Ms. Sandstrom was deposed in May. Well, well Ms. It was oh, maybe, three, wait, wait. Maybe it's Mr. Haley. Mr. Haley was, depo was deposed on February 1st. Yeah. The first. And, and when was it produced? The first of this data was produced three okay, weeks prior to We're not talking about the first of the data. We're talking about the first of production of Beatles beaten over the head with, which was produced at 349 the day before. No, that's fundamentally incorrect. It was produced three weeks before. Then, on the 20th, 10 days before the deposition, the plaintiff asked for more data. That was provided the day before the deposition. That wasn't used at the deposition. Then, the plaintiff asked for more data, and that was produced. And, 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 did it, and you know what? And did we have the... the why was it put in a spreadsheet? Because that's exactly what the plaintiffs asked for, Your Honor, was a spreadsheet. I mean, that's what you do with data from a relational database, is it comes out in a spreadsheet. Your Honor, again, this is Mr. Parker's motion. For wait, 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 wait. So you're saying, wait, well, you're saying that the da data came out of the um, system in the exact form it was produced in this case? Absolutely. That's what Mr. Shank's affidavit says. That's what Mr. Hampton's affidavit says. And that's what Ms. Anderson's affidavit Sense. And do we know what the ESI protocol is? Your Honor, I, I don't. I want to say this again, if I can, for the court. Yes. There was no ESI protocol. The defendants proposed one at the special master hearing. The plaintiffs rejected that proposal in the scheduling order. Instead, we got instructions in their discovery request, which we faithfully adhered to. And, and we highlighted that for the court. There are exhibits to the motion. The, the, the court, respectfully, Your Honor, is erring. I will, I will note my objection for the record. I'm at an absolute loss to understand what misconduct the court thinks it's sanctioning, and I'm at an even greater loss to, to understand what sanction, where these sanctions came from. Well, I, well, the, the sanctions were requested in the reply. They're, 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 wait, wait a second. The sanctions were requested in the reply as a um, alternative to strike in the answer. That's my recollection where those came from. I don't recall. Your Honor, I don't recall a specific request 
for a holding that Haley and Belsky drank enough hydrazine to cause an injury. You, I don't know how the court could possibly make that. Your Honor, that's in the reply. Uh, Mr. Neal, did you can make that? Maybe you should just strike the answer. And, and your honor, the wait, wait, toxicologist. Wait, wait, wait. This, I mean, I got this. And I, I didn't just pull this from thin air. I'm looking here at the reply. And, uh, it says you could, this is the top of page 10. You could preclude the Romeo defense. Exactly. Is, well, I mean, but, 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 what, wait, 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 wait. You're telling me they didn't ask for that? On the top of page 9 and 10 and 11? Yes, Your Honor, I'm telling you that they're asking to strike the answer. They're saying they've considered lesser sanctions, and here's why the lesser sanctions won't work. Those sanctions, Your Honor, are, are frankly crazy, even based on the plaintiff's testimony. They don't, by their own expert's admission, have ingested enough hydrazine. They don't come close. Here we go. It says plaintiffs have considered a lesser sanction, for example, the primary reason that UNFI is vigorously attempting to min minimalize Haley and Belsky's usage by casting doubt on their purchases is to create a foundation for the Romeo defense. I see that. And the it goes on. Um, Theoretically? That, that sentence, sir? No, I'm not talking about that sentence. It says, theoretically, the court could preclude the defense. That's not a request for sanctions. That's a suggestion. In lieu of, that's how I read that. Your Honor, I'm sorry. Uh, you're, you're striking a toxicologist who never relied on the data. Well, that's not you, true. You're making that a finding. Data, that data was presented to the toxicologist. <clears throat> and he gave an opinion that he didn't drink enough. And that was also given to the gastroenterologist, Dara. So he gave it to two of your experts. None, it's listed none right. of those experts, Your Honor, relied on that data for their opinions. Well, maybe that's a basis for a reconsideration. But, but, well, but, 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 and here's my point. I mean, I didn't realize Mr. Parker authored this. I mean, it was under Mr. Kim's, uh, but anyway, um, preclude Ramon, the Romeo defense by precluding UNFI from calling toxicologist Dr. Pastenbach to testify that Haley did not drink enough hydrogen. So that's, I mean, so I didn't just pull it out of thin air. That was the request made as an, as an alternative to strike in the hands. I, I don't see it. First of all, you're on right. Again, fundamentally, respectfully disagree with the court's findings of fact. There's been no misconduct here. Secondly, that's not an alternate request for a lesser sanction. That's, that's them saying why this sanction won't work and why you need to strike the answer. Well, but you're, but, you're right. making a finding based on uh, an absence of evidence. You're prejudicing co-defendants. Mm -hmm. okay. you, you're striking experts who don't rely on the data. And it's, it's well, error in a dozen well, different ways. Well, well, establish that to me. File the motion for reconsideration. You can do it. You have enough time. But to say that this isn't what they asked for, it says plaintiffs are, have considered potentially lesser sanctions. For example, that UN, UNFI is vigorously attempting to minimize Haley or Belsky's usage, casting doubt on their purchases to create a foundation for the Romeo defense. That's it, how I read that, and then this goes on, theoretically, the court could preclude the Romeo defense by, and these are recommendations of lesser sanctions. We, we see it fundamentally differently, Your Honor. Okay. We'll move to reconsider. Uh, the court, respectfully, sir, has erred, again, in a dozen different ways. Your Honor, I, I would like to just ask, as a part of this motion for reconsideration, whether or not can instruments is allowed to go ahead and provide additional briefing because the link of the court that I read it right now, based on what my experts did not review what Mr. Neal produced, which I I was at the deposition of Mr. Uh, Haley, and I was at the special master hearing with regard to the ESI question that you had. The plaintiffs rejected the ESI request by Mr. Neal. There was no alternative to that. He got instructions that said, do it this way. Were you talking about last week's ES or wow. last week's ESI wow. request? That would have been on a lot of different case. But be yeah. that as it may. Okay, that's a different case. Be that as it may, Your Honor, this ruling, I believe, absolutely hurts my client in an adverse way. And if I understand sanctions correctly, the sanction should be tailored to the specific party and their defenses. Instead, I'm now hit with a broad brush going against my client 
with this particular ruling. I, I just don't see the fairness in that. I have my own toxicologist. I share with Mr. Uh, with Milwaukee on our particular uh, doctor, uh, hepatologist who's going to be testifying on these things. None of them relied on these things with regard to that. We did rely on the medical records and the statements by the, uh, the plaintiffs in this case as to what they did and when they did it and all the alternative substances that they took. That defense now, by this ruling, I believe, is blown out of the water. I can't get up there and say, Kratom, because, oh no, they got hurt by this. You haven't even heard those motions yet on Kratom and turmeric. That hasn't even come to the court yet. I, I, I think, for, for fairness, please let my clients have the opportunity to be able to use our expert to say, there's no way at 200 parts per billion on hydrazine that these two individuals were somehow hurt when they started taking this stuff a year, started taking it, no the word I'm using, before they decided to go to the hospital. I, I, I am, I, I don't know how to get around that for my client. And I think the tailoring of this particular sanction only hurts my client if in fact the court strongly believes, and I believe the court strongly believes, I, I, I've heard you many times, you have not been stronger in a lot of ways that you've said things. I will grant you that. But the overall, I think, does hurt my client. And my client should not be mentioned in that motion, nor should it be having to be hit with these sanctions. With that, I'll stop here. And thank you very much for the time. I would just correct the record. Dr. Santa Maria is the toxicologist that Mr. Rasmussen has hired. I have just reviewed her entire March 24, 2023 report. She does not give, as I remember, she does not give a Romeo opinion. In other words, she does not say that there was insufficient hydrogen consumed by Haley Belsky or anyone else. Dr. Tanner. Is that what she says? She so, says that there's no way that that ORP meter could ever read hydrazine. It's not built for that, and therefore she can never that's give a different. That's a different, different issue. Different, different issue, issue right? If someone just stop interrupting for just a second. Therefore, she cannot make read it to conclusion that there was ever enough hydrazine that could be there because there's no way an ORP meter could ever do that. It's part of the problem that I've got in this case is that my, my client is being blamed for hydrazine. We have nothing to do with it. And I need a toxicologist to say, hey, there's no way we're even related to this stuff. Dr. Tenner's uh, uh, opinion will be addressed in a subsequent motion that he also did not consider how much hydrazine in dose was was uh adequate. I think that's incorrect. Well I'll show it. We're gonna read almost the whole deposition so you can point it out to the court. That, is, I mean, is that your second expert? Team? That's the second tenor, Your Honor. And tenor is subject to tenor's the one that says could have been, could have been, could have been. And that is motion for preliminary, which I thought might get on at the end of the day. So I want to make sure I understand the, the tenor's team. eighteen. Okay, but well, here's my question. Uh so how many of the defense experts opine? That um, that Haley and Belsky drank insufficient water. Your Honor, if I may answer that question, yes. not a single expert for anybody has opined based on the purchase data that Haley and Belsky drank an insufficient amount. Not a single expert. Every expert on the defense side that I'm aware of has opined that based on their own testimony. They didn't drink it. You know, like usual, Mr. Neal didn't answer the court's question, which was how many experts gave the Romeo defense. It was limited to Dr. Possenbach, who readily embraced it, and also Dr. Dara kind of split in there. Those were the only two experts that talked about it. When you talk about Dr. Dara, Dr. Dara is their gastroenterologist. Okay. Uh, um, All right, and, and we have, um, and then on the, uh, on the, Hannah's side, we have Dr. Santa Maria, who I, you know, I just read the report and I took her deposition. We're trying to find a part where she said she does not give hydrazine up in. Uh, so she didn't get into this area. And Dr. Tanner, like I said, he's on motion limiting number 18. And I will show you his opinion. You have a rebuttal report? There's a rebuttal by her. Just, I, 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 I think we need to probably brief this a little bit more, Your Honor, and that was my request, is, what, is if you're going to allow a motion for reconsideration of this particular issue, you can stay by this, that you will certainly allow Hannah to go ahead and, and have an opportunity to brief this, Your Honor, rather than we do this ad hoc right now in front of you like this. <coughs> when do I ever do ad hoc? 
If you don't, that's why I'm saying I just want to make sure that it's on the record that I requested it and that you'll allow it. That's all, Your Honor. Um, I don't think I've never not allowed it. I agree with you, Your Honor. <laughs> this is not the, this is why I just want that opportunity. Okay. If you're saying, I, I, first, Mr. Rasmussen, you have the opportunity. I'm Mr. Rasmussen, you have the opportunity to do whatever you think is in the best interest of your client. Thank you very much, Your Honor. I, I will now try not to talk. <laughs> and that's for anyone. Are we going to have an or, a written order on this point? Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Right. motions for reconsider. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And prepare the order, and then um, get it done post days. And Mr. Park will do it. Okay. That impacts the other decisions. You know, I'm happy to hear for a brief moment. Absolutely. I represent the water of Tennessee. This court swears is a third-party defendant of UNFW, UNFI, on a contribution and indemnity claim. Um, I understand the basis for the court's ruling included factors uh, favoring uh, the merits and need to deter. Uh, I would ask the court, part of the court's ruling include uh, a ruling that the third party defendants, indemnity and contribution defenses are not at all impacted. Sorry? No, no, interesting. I understand what you're saying. And, and it would no, be... They're not impacted. It, Your Honor? I, sir, you have whatever defenses would be available to you. Uh, and I think you're talking about the indemnity claim. I am, Your Honor. I understand. Uh, I think Mr. Ogu has a third-party defendant as well. You probably yeah. have... We have uh, Real Water Gold Coast as a third-party defendant to UNFW. And so um, when Mr. Parker prepares the order, we would just like to circulate it for everybody to approve quickly or state their objection that they're not going to approve it, just so we can see how it impacts both Real Water Gold Coast and also uh, my primary and independent clients. Um, on the ESI protocol, Your Honor, absolutely it was brought up to the special master in uh, last year. And uh, Mr. Hale asked if we needed one. Plaintiff stated that we didn't well agree and then discovery commenced. So this was a topic that was raised to Mr. Hale and there was no protocol of the agreement of the parties. If that's a concern, you can put it in a motion or you can add in the... Yeah, I just want to make sure the court's aware of all the facts, that's all. So where do we go from here? Which specific motion? Um, as far as the motion for to strike the answers would be in. That's 529. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, uh, 529. Granted in part, denied in part. Uh, denied it is to strike the answer. Uh, granted as to the question. Mm -hmm. Max. In lieu of striking the answer. Who have control on the circuit? Okay. And the motion? Then the defendant's motion for discovery of sanctions. This is number 268. Denied. Plaintiff's counter motion for adverse inference number 268. Denied. Thank you. So where do we go from here? Yeah, this is uh, Dr. Sanji Maria. I think I just want to put this to bed. Uh, page 37, talking about hydrogen, quote, I have no opinion on hydrogen in this case, unquote. That's his toxicologist. I'll, I'll, I'll come back with some things, but we'll, we'll figure it out. But figure it out, and if there's an issue, bring it to my attention. Thank you. So what's next, man? Judge, uh, the next one I have is um, is, is, is we're going to have this one. Sir? Uh, yeah, it's a uh, forty-nine handle number one. Handle number one. Okay. Yeah, handle number one to exclude the handle's orchestra. Are you going to be doing that one as well? Is that what you're saying? I'm not doing it. I think that's the next one.
next up? Oh, okay. The exhibit signed and his motion to remain number one. Exhibit A. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Scott Rasmussen, on behalf of Panda Instruments, Inc. This is our motion to eliminate number one. Oh, I'm with you, sir. Thank you. Title of the document uh, that we have is a motion to strike uh, the use of <clears throat> corporate structures of uh, what is believed to be Panda Instruments corporate structure. Let me make sure that you understand, Your Honor, this is not, I've got exhibit A up on the screen. I don't know if the court's able to see that. Assuming the court's able to see that, that is the corporate structure for a company called SID, S-I-D-U-S. It is the parent company of Hannah. Let's write that. It is the parent company of, I need to make sure I have strict that, of some Romanian companies where the manufacturer is. It is not the parent company of Hanna Instruments, Inc., the defendant in this case. In other cases, the alter egos of the Romanian company, companies, different ones, and the parent company of Hanna Instruments, Inc. are named, and they have answered those complaints filed by uh, Mr. Kemp on behalf of in several of his lawsuits and also other attorneys uh, who represent plaintiffs in the various uh, cases that are out there. In those cases, they have been named as alter egos. In other words, the cause of action has to do with an alter ego uh, type scenario. In the case before your honor, neither Sid US or Sid International. Do you need me to have that blown up a bit? No, no, I'm, I'm fine with no, it. No, I, okay. I want you to struggle. So let me, let me uh, you look at the very top right, it says organizational chart, Sid US, right. December 31st, 2021. Okay? Now, it doesn't say, uh, it doesn't have anything to say about Pan Instruments Inc. or Rhode Island Corporation. Nothing. Okay? We can go back out, Mark. Uh, and so you'll see up here at the top, kind of the left center, or just the center, it says Sid US Inc. USA. That's a, that's a Delaware corporation up there at the top. And then you'll see down here to the left, it's got Hannah Instruments Romania SRL. SRL in Romanian, and I don't speak it, Your Honor, so I'm not going to try to tell you exactly how to pronounce SRL, but consider it to be the exact same thing as saying Inc. It's their way of saying it. I don't speak Romanian. And it may be something a little bit off, but that's really where they get to is an Inc. Okay, so that's Hannah Instruments Romania. Again, that entity, uh, what's the best word for me to say? Mr. Peppermint at this time, that they were named in several of the lawsuits, but they're not named now, or uh, they were named in lawsuits and other lawsuits. They have not been named in this one. And in three or four of them, by my estimation, they have been dismissed by stipulation from those other lawsuits. Okay? So this remaining company, which was initially named, is no longer a party in other cases. Okay, so what we're trying to exclude and use is the corporate structure for a parent company that doesn't own Hanna Instrument Inc., a Rhode Island corporation. Okay, since it's not related to my entity, why should we have that be evidence in this case? Now, we, we provided the court with this information as a part of, hey, we've got this guy out here, the plaintiff's expert, Mr. Rich, I'm sure he's a competent S a CPA that's going to say, there's this conglomeration of all these companies that own all of this kind of stuff. We think all of them should be responsible for the ORP uh, media that's manufactured by Milwaukee. Now, the Milwaukee en entity is not on here, okay? Because it's actually a different company that's down in here and you can't see it. It's called Dosing Pump. Dosing Pump is the entity responsible for the construction or manufacturing of the ORP meter made by Milwaukee. Uh, I provided to the plaintiffs in an answer to interrogatories how 
the manufacturing entities worked together to make the ORP meter. Starts with dosing pump, okay? They make the meter, okay? They then get it to HANA Instruments Romania SRL, which we just talked about, and then they send it to HANA Instruments Inc., a Rhode Island corporation. After it's been packaged, the instructions are put into it, it's all in plastic and stuff like that, then we sell in the box, untampered, unopened, just in the, in the plastic, we send it on via purchase order to Milwaukee. Milwaukee Instruments then sells the meter to its customers. In this case, one customer for an ORP meter was AffinityLifestyles.com Inc., or also known as Real Watch. Okay? But why would this be evidence? And I'm not saying that it isn't evidence. I'm saying, why is this relevant? Because we have that probative versus prejudice. That's what we talked about in our motion. That's why this would ever be probative enough to go over the unfair prejudice of suggesting that all of these entities should be lumped together with HANA Instruments. And HANA Instruments, Inc., the Rhode Island Corporation, is not owned by any of these entities that are up here. Okay? And the plaintiffs did not do what? They did not name HANA Instruments International, not HANA Instruments USA, they did not name HANA Instruments International as an alter ego parent company who owns HANA Instruments Inc., a Rhode Island Corporation. So this information is only going to prejudice my client by saying all of these entities out there, okay, no deal with the Milwaukee meters that come to the United States are somehow this evidence should be in front of the jury saying this is somehow this big company. Okay? Now there's another sheet that talks about Hannah Instruments International. There's two that you have there, I believe you're on. There are two. Okay. Uh, the other one talks about the parent company of Hannah Instruments Inc. That's SID International. SID International is the parent company, but they are not named as an alter ego in this lawsuit. They are named as the alter ego in several other lawsuits, but they don't own any of the SID U.S. corporations at all, SID U.S. companies that they have in various parts of the world. Okay? The question is, why don't we just say, if you really want to say this is how it comes to it from Romania to the United States, to Milwaukee, and then to customers, that's all answered in the interrogatories. Mark, can you give me those interrogatory responses? I think it's number four. This, these are the responses to the interrogatories number four, or uh, to, to plaintiff's interrogatories from um, Hannah, Go, going down. Uh, Okay, so this, this, is the, this is the request right here, interrogatory number four. We said number one because we've given some earlier ones and they said some more. That's fine. We're, we answered it. Go down to the answers. Uh, I thought it was in here. It's not. Yeah, I can see that, Mr. Kavanaugh. Uh, the monitors over here are not showing. Go, go down some more, will you, Mark? We provided, and I thought it was four, and I, I, it must be on the other one. But there's the name of the responsible general manager. This is where he tells about which entities do it, who, who made it, all that stuff, and we prepared that and sent it to them. So where it came from was provided to the, to, to the plaintiffs in a form of a response to interrogatory. The documents that you see before us is on the website. You can just look it up, boom, there they are, okay? So you can go internationally anywhere that you want to. Let's say you're in, I don't know, Mexico. Okay, great country. If you go to Mexico and you need to go find a part from Hannah, you can go to Mexico and you can go to the Hannah uh, place there and find their stuff. And you just have to go to the website to figure it out. But that doesn't mean that they're related. But if you put all that in front of a jury or you say to Mr. Rich, just say that the whole conglomerate is responsible for an ORP meter sale between Milwaukee and affinity lifestyles in Las Vegas. That way, when we say we want whatever money that they want, 
we're really looking at all these entities which have nothing to do with this. There are very few entities that have to do with the ORP meter. And we've identified them for the plaintiff as a part of the interrogatories. That is the better option than putting out these corporate structures of two different entities, Sid US and Sid International, and saying that they're dispositive of everything that Hanna Instruments does when it sells an ORP meter to Milwaukee. And then Milwaukee turns around and sells it to its customers. I just think that it's, it's, uh, it's, patently, it, it's unfair. And the probative value of putting out those sheets is really to try to suggest, without having done any depositions of anyone that's out there on any of those companies except Adrian Petrian, who is the general manager of Hanna Instruments Romania. You'll see him under the SID US uh, document. His deposition was taken. Okay? Other than his deposition, no other entities. Okay? Also, Mr. Rich got up the financials from some weird website that was used in Britain to say this is what we think the value is of the Romanian company. And somehow that's going to, and that's the subject of another uh, motion that we will hear later on. But that's the, that's the basic parts of my motion. The, it, it is certainly relevant. It, was, it is a document in evidence in this case. But it should not be produced to a jury because all they're going to say is, oh, hey, huge company. No, actually not. Okay? And none of those are linked in to this specific ORP meter. And we did in the interrogatories provide the information, and they have that in there, and they can certainly use those answers to the interrogatories as the evidence they want to as far as how this ORP meter got to where it is. With that, Your Honor, that's all I have. But I think the court is understanding a lot. If you have any questions, I'll certainly answer those. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Peppermint. Thank you, Your Honor. I can't remember the last day off I had, so maybe it's me, but I, I didn't really follow much of what um, Mr. Rasmussen was saying. But um, boiled down, I think, to the most basic question before the court, he's arguing that the corporate structure of Hanna Instruments, and by extension, Milwaukee Instruments, because they're related entities, uh, is somehow irrelevant, and to talk about this would be unduly prejudicial. Uh, he didn't identify any prejudice that would come from talking about the corporate structure. Uh, and I think that was one of the issues with the motion that we raised in our opposition is there's nothing very specific that he seeks to exclude regarding the corporate structure. He broadly just seeks to exclude all uh, reference, discussion, comment, questions at all. Um, I, I don't think that's a request that this court can grant, and I think Mr. Rasmussen unintentionally uh, explained the reason why. He showed the court the interrogatory where they respond to a question about all the people who were involved in the uh, manufacture and drafting of the labeling and the people who are, have primary responsibility for the warnings with respect to the, the meter that is the subject of this case. And he went through and he identified the foreign entities and he identified the general manager, Adrian Petrian, and uh, what he was referring to there is what is the relevant evidence in this case? Remember, we have a uh, product defect case against related to this meter and a failure to warn case uh, and, a, and a unreasonably dangerous claim. And the company, the first, one of the most elemental things that we have to prove is that the defendants, Hannah and Milwaukee, are in the chain of distribution of the meter. They either manufactured it, distributed it, or sold it. And 
So that alone is, is necessary to show the corporate structure because uh, this meter was put together by multiple different companies uh, around the world that are related to Hanna and Milwaukee. It was provided to Hanna US. Hanna US sold it to Milwaukee. And Milwaukee sold it in the, in the marketplace. So to try to preclude us from explaining the defendants in this case and their uh, status as a distributor and seller and within the chain of distribution of the product that's issued, I, I don't understand how you could do that or even why that is being requested. In addition, uh, there are important um, factual issues that implicate the corporate structure. Uh, for example, one of the witnesses in this case is Adrian Petrian. He is the general manager of the Romanian entity, Hanna SRL, who uh, was responsible for um, preparing the user manual and the labeling and the warning that came with the subject meter. Uh, Mr. Uh, Petrian was deposed. He's in Romania. Mr. Rasmussen flew to Romania to defend his deposition. Uh, we've designated um, page and lines from Mr. Petrian's deposition. He's going to testify in this case. He's going to be a witness. Uh, if the, she's going to talk about the meter, the the manual, uh, and to suggest that we can't say that he's an employee or the general manager of Hanna Romania SRL is not a, a rational request. I mean, here's my question for you, and it's, I, mean, I, I kind of get the thrust of Mr. Rasmussen's motion, and uh, when you talk about, is it Petri, Petriac? Petrian. And he was, I guess, the, uh, was he the 30B6 for the Hanna Instruments Romania? Is that what he was? Or? He's just a general manager, not a 30B6, although I could have designated him as such. I don't believe that was the way the notice was done by the plaintiffs. I, as I recall, he's not a 30B6. Correct, Eric? As I recall. He's a, a manager. But he's the general manager, yes. Yeah, so I'll trade yeah. it Yeah, yeah. But my question is this. Okay, I'm looking here at the left side of the chart. We have Hanna Instruments Romania. We have Hanna Instruments is that bacon? bacon? I can't even see it. What's the second one right after, right under Hanna Instruments Romania? That's Hanna Instruments. I don't have it in front of me right now. I apologize. Because you want to pull up the uh, okay. opposition. It's exhibit one of the opposition. Okay. Let's put it on the screen. Baki you. Baki you. Here's my question. I mean, I, I, I understand what's going on here. Why do we need all the steps to the right? To the right? Like, I'm looking here. Yeah. It seems like, to me, this might, he's there. I don't know if this is a chain or not. I don't have any listen to the testimony. Why wouldn't it go up this way? Is why wouldn't it? Well, is there anything wrong with that? Or you uh, again, we, we provided, you're asking me the question, I assume. We provided in our interrupters that exact same information right there. So why have so to try to up the left side? It's it's not quite your honor, it doesn't. Close. Close, but we're you know, it's like with hand grenades and fortunes. But my point is as I look at it from this perspective, we have uh, Hannah Instruments Inc., a Rhode Island company, a corporation. We have Milwaukee Instruments Inc., a North Carolina corporation. I get that. But why would we need the entire Spreadsheet. Uh, Chris, can you pull up page three of the opposition? And Your Honor, we we don't need the entire uh, organizational chart in terms of are we going to go through each structure one by one? No, there a lot of those companies are related entities that have carried on operations in foreign country that are neither here nor there and won't be a, a topic of questions or uh, argument. They don't have anything to do, to do with it. But if you look at the opposition where, where the we quote from why Hanna Instruments um, and Milwaukee Instruments corporate structure is, is important and relevant is that they explain the different 
aspects of the company who have different responsibilities as, in terms of manufacturing, labeling, mm -hmm. providing warnings for the product that's at issue. And that, is that on page three at line nine? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Okay. So you have this kind of complicated um, corporate structure that having a corporate structure like this is, is not prejudicial. It's not harmful in, in, to um, Hannah Instruments in any way. There's no prejudice that comes from being able to explain the different elements of the corporate structures coming together. And in fact, it, it would be prejudicial to us if we were precluded from being able to explain it in an easy to understand way. Because what the testimony is going to be in this case is different witnesses talking about different uh, aspects of the device, warnings, uh, labeling, instructions. And they're pointing the finger elsewhere, saying, well, I don't know, Hannah, uh, Romania, SRL is the one who drafted the, the instruction manual. Hey, see, I'm not saying Hannah, SRL shouldn't be included. I mean, I'm looking for example, I look at it, look at the <coughs> chart, Hannah Instruments Taiwan Limited. What do they have to do with the case? Nothing. Okay. And, and uh, that's kind of my point. It appears to me, I mean, I don't know uh, specifically how you plan on utilizing this at trial. I don't know what the defense would do for Mr. Rasmussen, but if something's irrelevant, should, should it be on the chart? That's, all, that's my point. Maybe we can condense the chart to, from the top and then the left side only. I mean, I don't know if that's part of your... If the you're paragraph that they've got in their opposition right there, that's our answer. That, that's easy right there. You want to put it into some sort of a squares? I'll be happy to review that as a demonstrative evidence and we can go on our way. Because I'm looking here at Hannah Instruments, Inc., a Rhode Island corporation distributes Hannah to our P meters, distributed by Hannah Instruments SLR in the United States, and they're on the chart, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the ink, you have an SRL, you have a dosing pump, and you have Milwaukee. That's it. Is there anyone else we're missing? Judge, I think some of the testimony implicates the Milwaukee SRL too. Milwaukee SRL uh, does not exist in that format. Milwaukee SR is just a distributor of the ORP meter in Europe. Now, if we were dealing with them selling stuff in the United States, that might be one thing, but they don't. Milwaukee Inc., a North Carolina company, is the only company that sells Milwaukee instruments to, as a retailer, to customers in the United States. Uh, my only comment is, is that the, the corporate structure is what it is. That's the chart that they produced. I don't think there's, a, there's no specific issues relating to the other companies in Taiwan or, where, or Thailand, wherever else they are. But I, I don't think there's any need to go through the chart and try to scrub them or create um, blanks or, or modifications for something that is really a, a harmless uh, part of the, the evidence. It's their corporate structure. The, the entities that are referenced in the testimony are relevant. We use the structure or the chart just to explain who, which witnesses from which company. Um, so but, to me, but, it just seems like a, a few, few but, times. But are there any... For example, any witnesses from Hannah Instruments <clears throat> Logistics Far East, Hong Kong? No. Okay. Any witnesses from Hannah Instruments Switzerland? No. Adwa KR, KFT? No. Daniel Eddy? No. Limited. No, there's only. Outside of those that what, are... All I'm just trying to go through an exercise. Yes, yes, sir. I apologize. If, you're not, you're not, if they're not relevant, they're not relevant. They are not. Right? Okay. But anything else there? Um, 
just to the extent that we're going to take off entities from the organizational chart that aren't relevant to reserve the opportunity in case there are references in the testimony that aren't acknowledged today or come up. If we overlook something, we can always revisit that. This is what I'm going to do, and, I, and in a general sense, I mean, I haven't had a chance to go through in detail what the organizational chart is based upon the answers to the discovery. But it seems to me at, 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 as a really good starting point Everything to the lower right should be off the chart, right? Because yep. it's not relevant. I mean, and maybe you can, as far as on the left, you got Hannah Instruments Romania, you have Hannah Instruments Mackey U. That's how. Oh, is that that the count? Okay. And that's how. Okay. And we have Milwaukee, Romania. That's it. And, that, and Mr. Kemp asked that question, right? And, and Milwaukee is an entity. It only sells the Milwaukee uh, ORP meter in Europe. So it is irrelevant to the case here because the entity that sold the ORP meter to Real Water was Milwaukee Instruments, Inc. in North Carolina Corporation. They are not, therefore, in the chain of distribution. In other words, they get it from Hannah Instruments, SRL Romania to Hanna Instruments in actually it's in it's in Hungary uh, and then they distribute to Europe so they're, they're just like a distributor just like Milwaukee is here they just happen to have a territory of Europe. Okay. Mr. Peckman, anything else you can add? I, I would add that it's not just the chain of distribution that's important to the extent these entities were involved with the development of the, the designer or um, manufacturer of the meter, the labeling, the warnings, uh, all of that um, I think is potentially relevant and should not be excluded. And that this motion as I understand it, is separate. It's limited to the uh, the claims, the um, strict liability, strict product liability claims at issue. That the financial issues are a separate motion that's going to be heard later. Get the last word. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll be very brief. <clears throat> the two charts that you're looking at are not an instrument corporate structure charts. They are on the head of instruments website in case a customer says, hey, I'm in Kazakhstan. How do I find a, a head of instruments device that I need for whatever they're doing? You can go on our website or the website of Hannah and you can find something having to do with Kazakhstan. Now, if you want to do that, you're probably going to have to go to Dubai to get the closest place in order to do that. But that's how you would, you would handle that situation. That's why it's there. It's not, let me make sure I understand, the corporate structure of Hannah Instruments, Inc., in Rhode Island Corporation. It is and shows the two parent companies, Sid U.S. and Sid International. Sid U.S. does not own either Milwaukee Instruments, Inc., a North Carolina corporation, or... Hannah Instruments, Inc., a Rhode Island corporation. SID International owns those two companies, okay? SID US does own Hannah Instruments, SRL, a Romanian company, which was named, as I said, in other cases. Remember, I think we would have a, I would have a struggle in this in this response of trying to get something done here, if in fact we have Sid US or Sid uh, uh, International as parties in this case. They're not here, so I need these corporate charts to be out because they they're not even about Hannah Instruments Inc. If it was a corporate chart that said here's the president uh, whose deposition was taken of Hannah Instruments Inc. and and here's he he is the president, and then I have a CFO and a COO and and whoever are the all the other officers. That's the corporate structure we don't have in front of this court. Instead, we have this, these two things, and if we put those up in front of the, the jury, my concern is that it would be unfairly prejudicial with a bunch of irrelevant evidence in it, along with only very limited evidence. 
this there. And with that, I'm hoping that the court will see this. Well, I, I, I understand what your, your position is. I'm more than a grant. I just don't know what to grant. I mean, because so, so we have the answers to the interrogatories, Your Honor. Right. The information about who manufactured, from what materials, who did what as far as distribution, how it got from Romania to the United States, which was hand instrumenting, all that is in the answers to interrogatories. So if they want to use the interrogatory answers and they want to put that right up on the on the, on the, on the uh, screen for the jury to review, I'm fine with that. I don't know how to get away from that. I'm not trying to be uh, or suggest that you can't use responses to interrogatories as a part of evidence in this case, but it should be just limited to that. It doesn't need to have these corporate these corporate organizational charts of two parent companies. They're not parties to this case, or have been uh, so identified as alter ego. Okay, I'll, I'll grant it with one condition. Okay, and hypothetically, and, I, and this motion hasn't been fully developed, but if there's a situation where one of the other hands be Anna entities potentially might have been, might have been involved, then they'll be part of it. You're, you're right, Your Honor. And in fact, one of the comments that Mr. Pepperman said is that oh, um, Adrian Petrian was the person responsible for the the uh, instructions. Mr. Petrian speaks Romanian, doesn't speak English. He was not. In fact, he said so in his deposition. Yeah, I didn't write that. He doesn't speak English. So, so there will be someone else that he's going to have to say on the record, this is the person I believe that wrote it. At the time, I think he said, I don't know who it is that wrote that. He, he, he didn't know. And that's, and that's a fair response to question that you just don't really respond to. But he may be able to identify that person, and that person may be working at a different head uh, uh, corporation. And the question is, was it the one in the United States? The answer is no. Okay. Well, my point is, if there were any of the other right. organizations involved in the product design, um, the warnings or instructions, or mm -hmm. somehow involved in the production and the distribution process, they can be part of it too. But not until then. Understood. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll prepare the order and run it by uh, plaintiff's counsel. So, Your Honor, if I can just ask for a brief clarification so I understand. The, we can use the or organizational chart limited to the uh, companies on the chart that had some role or involvement or. Some a, role, involvement, or activity. Okay. How's that? Let me write that. Role, involvement, what was the other one? Activity. Related to production, distribution, warnings. Role, or... involvement, activity. Got it. I'll write that and then uh, I think uh, that testimony has already been provided as part of that. But so I'll, I'll put that in the order. Yes, Your Honor. Next, next would be the expert report of Mark Rich. Is that correct? And then, no. uh, I think I'm just getting that, that was Mr. Parker's motion. Uh, we'll skip to hand number two to exclude part of expert report based on medical examination conducted by the Yeah, and we were going to withdraw that motion. Uh, That's what we thought. Yeah. Sorry, I, I can't and for the record, Mr. I'll, I'll go up to the record and make the record for you. Defendant the Hannah here. Instruments motion eliminate number two. Yes, sir. Scott Rasmus on behalf of Hannah Instruments to make the record clear. And instruments uh, motion limit number two with regard to the uh, failure of Dr. Hunsworth to do to not Hunsworth. That's a that's a point I put uh, Hudson's. Uh, we are withdrawing that motion. Uh, you know, we were not provided notice in Rule 35. Rule 35 doesn't quite give us that uh, amount of uh, leeway in order to be able to hear the secret discussions that he had with all the different claims. But that's okay. We'll we'll withdraw that motion because I couldn't find it. I went back and checked the case management order that Floyd Hale, or Special Minister Hale, uh, put out of this case and did not find that it uh, provided that we had to be there. Although a subsequent ruling, and I'll just make the record clear, said that all testing that was supposed to be done of water or other things had to be able to be observed by both the plaintiffs and the defendants in case. This does not speak specifically to medical, at least that's what that's not the ruling of Special Minister Floyd Hale. So um, I'll leave it at that and withdraw the motion. Okay. You got that? Yes. So next up will be the 
Yes, sir. The next one, the one off I have is motion to number 14. The plaintiffs conclude the meeting defendants from arguing or inferring that it is defense that board meters do not cause or measure types. And, you know, and, Judge, it might be a good idea to kind of lay out the next three or four. The next one that I have and we skipped is um, UNFW's motion for summary judgment on claims for Richard Belsky. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, That's I thought we were skipping we both the Belsky and Haley one until tomorrow. Okay. Then after motion limiting number one, it would be Hannah's motion limiting number three. Right. And the plaintiffs have requested uh, that that particular motion be postponed uh, from argument. Uh, I'm happy to go ahead and do that. Is that isn't that the request that we had? Yeah, we well, request, that was Teddy's motion. Three and four were Teddy's motion. And I'm fine to do that. So, so, I was, so the next one I have is 14. The order I have today is 14, 17, plaintiffs 14 and 17, 18, and then I had 19, but I understand 19 is supposed to continue to small for some reason. Can we take a break maybe right now and then we can get that organized? You can. All right. We'll be in. All right. So you're saying next up would be number Yeah, I think it, it goes, it's going to go 14, 17, 18. Right? What about 16? Uh, 16, we're going to skip, but I think the ruling today. Yeah, the ruling today covers 16. Here's a spreadsheet. So next up will be uh, 14. Defendant Hannah Instruments. The plaintiff's motion number 14. So when you say it covers it, granted or denied or? Well, let's move for now. Oh. <coughs> and, and for the record, next up after the break will be motion number 14 to approve the meter defendants from arguing, interfering, or, or inferring that. It is a defense that the ORP meters do not cause or measure hydrogen. That's, That's it. Yeah, I'm going to be opposing that. 